cool. All right, so we have, we have made our way through chapter nine, which is all about quadratics. So we're gonna do some review, we're gonna do some review today and tomorrow. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so before we get started, let's discuss the mystery of the squiggle. I don't know where this came from. I don't know why it's there. And it won't go away. And it just shows up. Every time I start a uh, new PowerPoint or something I want to put together for you guys, this thing is there. And it's on like every page. <laughs> and I can't get rid of it. I don't know what the deal is. So we'll just kind of laugh about it and we'll leave it at that. All right, so we'll go ahead and go back to the beginning here. This would be section 9-1. And it says, solve quadratic equation by graphing. Yeah, I don't get it either. All right, so typically this is not how we're going to solve things. Okay. But I figured, man, eh, they got it here. What the heck? We'll take a look at it. So, of course, we're going to use Desmos. So let's bring up Des. So Desmos incoming. All right. So that one was x squared. And then minus 16. Let's get this guy out of the way. So solving by graphing is pretty good because, as you can see, here's one spot where we cross the axis, so that's x equals negative 4. And over here, we cross at x equals positive 4, which, will make, which makes sense because if I put in 4 times 4 here, I get 16 minus 16, which is, in fact, 0, right? And same deal if I put in negative 4 times negative 4, I get a positive 16. And again, 16 minus 16, also 0. Okay. So this part was more just to kind of show you that when we solve a quadratic, we are looking for the spot where it crosses the x-axis. And this actually does come into play quite a bit in many different industries, in sports, and physics, all kind of places where this is kind of a significant point that people are interested in for different reasons. Okay. So let's do the same thing for the next one. Let's see what he is. So this is x squared minus 6x plus 9. All right, so let's do that. Let's bring the des back in. So x squared was minus 6x. Okay, so we have a unique situation here in that this is just touching at this point and going back up. So what that tells us, and we figured this out later on as we go through this, is this particular equation will factor into what we would call a perfect square. And if you remember, we'll, we'll jump ahead a little bit here. When we were doing the completing the square thing, we would take the number in front of x, in this case, negative 6, right? And then we would divide him by 2, so it would give me negative 3. And then we would take the negative 3 and square it, and we get positive 9. So the reason we would do that kind of stuff is because then this turns into x. And then the number after we divide by 2 is minus 3. And square that. My cursor got off. There we are. So we're going to square that. So notice now the one in blue and the one in red are exactly the same. 
And this one here makes a little more sense because if you pop in a positive three for X, three minus three is zero and zero squared, still zero, okay? But it will work for the other one because if we take three and square it here, three times three is nine, then we have minus six times three is 18. So this is gonna be nine minus 18, so it's minus nine plus nine, also zero, okay? And then this relates to what we were talking about fairly recently here, the, the bit about the discriminant, which was the stuff underneath the square root in the quadratic formula. And we said if that number turned out to be zero, we would get only one answer. And it would be a situation where the graph would come down and just touch at one spot. Okay, so that's what we've got going on here. So this was kind of something that we were going to see a little further down the line. They were just kind of getting discussed, you know, just started discussing what these different graphs look like. Okay. So that's what we were going for here. Questions? All right, let's check out a couple more. And you see the squiggle is still here. <laughs> All right, so again, it says solve by graphing. So this guy is x squared plus 2x plus 8. All right, let's bring in decimals again. This is x squared plus plus eight. All right, so we're done with this guy. Where's this guy at? Weird. Why is he not showing up? Very strange. And again, there is your x square, and then let's find this back. X squared. Oh, I think the problem is we're not up far enough. There we go. Okay. All right, so notice here that we're not crossing the x-axis, are we? Matter of fact, this thing, we have to zoom out a little bit just to even see the x-axis. So there we go. All right, so let's talk about a couple key things here. Notice here we have our y-intercept. And our y-intercept is just the number. So any kind of function, doesn't matter how big it is, how fancy it is, you know, what kind of function it is, it doesn't matter. If you have just a regular number with no variable, this is always your y-intercept right there. Because when x equals 0, all the rest of that stuff goes away, and you're left only with the 8. Okay, so that's why that's always your y-intercept. So notice on this guy down here, this is our lowest point here, right? So when x equals negative 1, then the whole thing equals 7, and it goes up from there. So for this particular one, if we are solving by graphing, we don't touch the x-axis ever. We don't cross it. We don't touch it. So it starts above it and just goes from there. So technically, there are no real solutions for this. There are only real solutions when you cross the x-axis. So that's what's going on there. You saw how uh, you know, I got confused about it because I'm like, where's my graph? And then it dawned on me, it's like, well, the graph's not anywhere near there. I have to move up. Okay. Any questions on that one? So if you graph this thing, and it doesn't touch the axis, then there are no real solutions. 
we can get those imaginary or complex solutions, as you've seen from the quadratic equation and also from the um, completing the square process. All right, so let's check out one more. All right, so this guy is 2x squared minus 11x plus 5. So this time we're going to have two. That made our graph a little skinnier. And then this was plus five. What was negative 11? Yeah, negative 11. All right, so this guy's going to be minus 11. So minus 11x. Okay. All right, so this one drops down quite a bit, right? All right. So notice this one. We have one spot where we cross at five. And over here we've got 0.5. So that means this guy kind of factors, right? But we see one answer is going to be x equals one half, and the other one's going to be x equals five. And that should make sense because if we factored this guy, we would have one answer. What we do, let's see, let's turn this out here. Looks like one of them is going to be 2x minus 1 and times, and it's going to be x plus, no, minus 5, no bad. So notice there, there's the factored form, there's the non-factored form, but notice that they're at the same spot. Okay? So again, this is just two different ways to write the same quadratic equation. But this one here, it's much easier to tell where we're going to cross. So if you put in a 5 here, the whole thing is going to go to 0. That's what that's telling us right there. And then if we put in 1 half right here, 2 times 1 half is 1, and 1 minus 1 is, in fact, 0. So there's your 0. 0.5, and of course you can use 0. 0.5 as well. So you can really get a lot out of using the graphs. Normally we don't like graphs, but of course with Desmos it makes life a lot easier because it's easier to see the graphs without having to go through all the, the hassle of actually graphing it on your own. Okay, so that was the first section. That was 9.1 kind of was talking about what these things look like graphically. And like I say, when you have something good like Desmos here, it makes it a lot easier to, to look at those things and kind of visualize what's going on. Okay. We still good? All right, so Desmos is going to exit stage left. There we go. All right, so let's see what else we've got in store for us here. So it says, find the solutions for each equation using a table, round to the nearest tenth. Now, as it turns out, we really don't need a table for this, but it gives you an idea where this thing's going to go. Okay. So in this case, we know this is what we call the difference of two squares. All right, so here we have x squared minus 64. There's no middle term, right? So this is one of those where we can factor it pretty easily. So we really don't need a table. A table is not an efficient way to do this because if you just start haphazardly plugging in numbers, it's going to take you a while to figure out what the answer is. So for this guy, we can say, well, this is going to be x minus 8 times x plus 8, okay? And then that equals 0. So then x could be 8, and x could be negative 8, okay? 
So, I mean, if you're sitting here messing around plugging in numbers, like you plugged in zero for x, you get negative 64 because basically the x squared goes away. Now, that would be your y-intercept. So then what this thing's going to look like, let's, uh, let's bring Desmond back in here. I'll uh, grab that. All right, so if we've got x squared. So as predicted, here we are at negative 8 and positive 8. And then if we scroll way down here, way down here, I mean way down there, so we're at negative 64. So if you started plugging in numbers, so if you plugged in like x equals 1, you're going to get 63. And if you plug in x equals 2, you're going to get 60. So that's right here. I just missed it here. But you can kind of go along these things and scan. There. So they want you to sit there and do that stuff. Like if we put in 3 we get negative 55. And you're just going to keep getting closer and closer to zero as you get closer and closer to eight. Okay. So that's another nice feature of Desmos is you can like just click on the line and kind of see where it's going to be at. So where's another good point? It looks like right here. Oh, anyway, you get the idea. All right. So let's take a look at the other one. So now he is x squared minus 6x minus 16. And again, if you start just plugging in numbers into a table, it's going to take you a while to figure this out. Okay. So it appears that this guy probably factors as well. So let's go ahead and do some factoring. We're going to be doing some factoring here in some of the other sections too, but let's go ahead and start with that. Let's go ahead and switch up colors. All right. So when we factor, remember we go ahead and set up shop like this. And we've got an x squared, so we're going to put an x here and an x here. Okay. So then we did something we were calling the diamond method where we would go like this, we say, okay, the last number is negative 16. So we'll put him there. The middle number is minus 6. Okay, remember this, guys? So then, we say, I need two numbers that are going to multiply together and give me negative 16 and add together and give me minus 6. Now, we know, since we're multiplying two numbers together and getting a negative number, one of these guys has to be negative. Right? And then the only numbers we can use have to multiply together and give us 16. Right? So there aren't a lot of choices here. There's going to be 1 and 16, there's going to be 2 and 8, and there's going to be 4 and 4. So which set of numbers should we use? Keeping in mind, they have to add together and give us minus 6. So should we use 1 and 16? Should we use 2 and 8? Or should we use 4 and 4? So another thing I consider when you do this kind of stuff, let's write down our possibilities here. So we've got 1 and 16, we've got 2 times 8, and we've got 4 times 4. Is when the middle number is negative 6, 
that means our numbers have to be six units apart. So of our three pairs of possibilities here, which ones are six units apart? Well, four minus four is zero, right? So that's not it. And then one and 16, so 16 minus one is 15. That doesn't work either. So I guess it's these guys here since nobody seems to be able to answer me. And again, since the overall is negative, the bigger of the two numbers is going to be the negative. So it's going to be like that. So this would be x minus 8 and then x plus 2. All right, so let's go to Desmos. So we've got x squared minus 6x. All right, so there's our guy. And notice that we cross at minus 2 and positive 8. And then the factored form the x plus 2. Notice it gives us a line because at that point x plus 2 is a line. Then times x minus 8. All right. Let's go make this a little smaller. So then we notice, whoops, don't, don't go over there. That's good. That our graphs are exactly the same. One is the factored form. One is the non-factored form. And again, the factored form, if we plug in negative 2 right here, we'll get 0. And if this term is zero, then the whole thing is zero. And then same thing over here. We plug in eight here, eight minus eight also zero. So that's our guy. Questions? All right, since you guys aren't into talking, I'll just move on. All right, so the video game company uses the profit model, minus x squared plus 14x minus 39, where x is the number of video games sold in thousands, and p of x is the profit earned in millions of dollars. Nice. So it says, how many video games will the company have to sell to earn a maximum profit? It says, and how many video games will the company have to sell to show no profit? Okay, so we can do this one a couple different ways. Yeah, not bad, right? So one thing we could do, if you remember, is we could say, well, remember to figure out the x coordinate of the vertex, and that's what we're looking for here, is since this is a minus x squared, your graph is going to look like this, right? We're looking for this top point right here. So we want to know how many games do we have to sell, that's this number, and how much money we're going to make, that's this number. So the first number is how many games we're going to sell, that's the x, and y is how much money are we going to make. So a couple ways we, excuse me, there's a couple ways we could do this. We could use a method that we've used in the past where we figure out the x value with this little formula here. So x equals minus b over 2a. Okay. So b is 14. So then minus b would be negative 14, okay? Then over 2 times a, and a in this case is minus 1. Remember, when there's no number here, but you've got a negative sign, it's technically negative 1. 
So we've got minus 14 over minus 2. So that means it's going to be 7. Okay. So they have to sell 7,000 games to make their max profit. Okay. So the way we figure out what the max profit is, is then we say we're going to plug in 7 wherever we see X in this guy right here. So I've got minus, and then we've got 7 squared, and then plus 14, and then times 7, and then minus 39. All right, so this is going to be negative 49. This is going to be negative 39, obviously. So we just need to do 14 times 7. That sounds like a calculator situation, doesn't it? Come here, come over. So we go 14 times 7. That's 98. So we put 98 in here. All right, so it's plus 98. So we get 98. So we'll go back to our calculator. And then minus 49. And then minus 39. So if they sell 7,000 games, they make a quick 10 million bucks. Not bad. Those are pretty expensive games. Am I, am I wrong about that? Because check it out. So if we had 10 million, so 10, 100,000, a million, 10 million, right? And we divide that by 7,000. Check me if I'm wrong, but $1,428, isn't that a little expensive for a video game? Whoever came up with this problem didn't think that part out, did they? No. Yeah. I thought video games were like, what, 40 bucks maybe? I don't know. I don't buy video games. Never had a video game system ever. Although my wife won a Wii system from Dave and Buster's. So she would play the games where you get like tickets. Yeah, that's what I kind of figured it was. I mean, it, it's kind of cool. But no, she got enough tickets at Dave and Buster's to get a Wii. And I mean, it was like 4,500 tickets or something ridiculous. But she's like wicked good at those games. <laughs> I mean, we really didn't spend that much money to get the thing. You know, because when she was getting some guys like, man, you must have spent a fortune for this. And then not really. And we were going to go play video games anyway, so, you know, it's no big deal. It's like, oh, here, have a, have, a, have a Wii system on top of it all. It's like, okay, cool. So, yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about where we would show no profit here. So what happens in business is you have that peak point, and like I said, normally they do have some sort of program or equation that kind of models what they're doing okay and so the peak is going to be this is like we want to sell this many games if we sell more games than that means we have to produce more games and it might mean that our production costs are going to be too high okay so that's going to take away from our profit so that's why the quadratic is actually a pretty good indicator of what a business model is going to look like. Let's go ahead and put this guy on the desk here. So we've got 14x minus 39. Hang on. So bring back des. Here we go. So this is going to be minus x squared. And then minus 14x. And then minus 39. That doesn't seem right. Is this plus 14? I bet it is. Let's go back here real quick. Yeah, plus 14. Negative signs get you every time. So let's make him plus. 
That's more like it. Okay. So again, we said we go way up here. I mean, way up here. So let's get this guy down like that. Yeah, it's just too big, isn't it? So this thing's actually going by 100. So it's going to go all the way up to 10 million. Now yeah, we're not going to see the top of this thing, are we? Okay. So then. And zoom back in here. So this graph is going all the way up and peaking at 10 million. We're not even going to see that. So let's go back down here and talk about where it's going to cross at. All right. So let's go here. So here's our point where we cross at. So 2.381. So what this is telling us that if we sold be like 2,381 video games, we have to sell that many video games just to break even. Okay. And then we figured out that if we sold 7,000 of them, that's when we're going to make our maximum profit of 10 mil. All right. So they literally do this kind of stuff in business. Now, obviously, it's all computerized and everything else. So it's a little different story, but that's where we're at. Okay, so kind of an interesting problem. It's nice to occasionally connect it to something that's you know, an actual thing. All right, so let's get decimals out of here again. The calculator, so we've got the stuff all figured out. Okay, let's move on. All right, so here's the part where we talk about factoring again. So maybe we'll do a couple of these guys and we'll call it for today. So again, factoring is where we're going to basically set up like this, particularly when we just have an X squared. Put an X here and an X here. And we want that to equal zero. Okay, so again, we're going to say, all right, we want this to multiply together and give us nine and add together to give us six. So again, not a lot of choices. There's one and nine, there's three and three. And one and nine adds to 10, so I guess we're going with three and three. And since everybody's positive, everybody's positive here as well. Okay, so x plus three and x plus three, and you know the lazy math guys, they're never gonna write that twice. So they're gonna write it like this. And then, whoops, that's a two. <laughs> Oops. Let's fix that up. All right, so then that's going to be three. So technically, we only get one answer here, right? So our answer on this guy is just going to be x equals negative three. Okay, so let's go ahead and factor the other one. Change colors here just for laughs. All right, so same deal. I'm going to go ahead and factor. We got x squared, so it's going to be x here and an x here. This guy's negative. The only way you multiply two numbers again and get a negative, one's going to be plus and one's going to be minus. Okay, so then our only possibilities here is 1 in 10 and 2 in 5, and we need them 3 apart. So that's not going to be the 1 in 10, that's going to be the 2 in 5. So then, all we have to do is we say, well, since it's negative 3, the bigger number is going to go with the negative, like that. Or you can do this bit again as well. So this is minus 10. This is minus 3. I know one of these guys has to be negative. So if I make this minus 5 and 2, those add together and give me negative 3. They multiply together and give me 10. So same answers. And then to get your, <clears throat> get your actual answers, there'll still be two of them again. 
we just pretty much switch the side on this guy and on this guy. And there's our guys. Questions? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's a good place to stop for today. We'll continue this discussion on tomorrow. Uh, I already have attendance for you guys, so we're good to go there. And I will thank you for stopping by. And we'll see you all next time.